Genesis to Revelation on Sunday nights and find ourselves making progress through the historical book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. And so their building was too small for them too small for the school of the prophets. Isn't that great? In the middle of all of the evil that was going on in the northern kingdom of Israel, God was, as we saw this morning, continuing his work. And his work was not going to be unhindered. It wasn't going to cease. And so what he's doing, there isn't room for what what he's doing here now with the expansion of these young sons of the prophets learning uh, what it is to walk with God and to serve the Lord from this great prophet Elisha. And so they said to Elisha, Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. Oh, if it were only that easy today. <laughs> We'd all get a beam tonight somewhere. And, you know, land must have been cheap back in those days and didn't have the codes that we have to deal with. They can just go out and get the wood and then fasten it together. And, you know, they've got a good enough place to uh, for God's purposes to be accomplished. You know, it only needs to last uh, in, in their lifetime, you know. And then let the second generation build their own place and learn the lessons that are found there in building it. And so they said, let us go ahead and do that. And Elisha answered, and he said, go, you go ahead and do that. Gives him permission. And then one of them said, please consent to go with your servants. We, we didn't want you to say go. We want to go do this, but we want you to come along. And we want you to be a part of it. And so really something very, very beautiful here in Elisha's life and his relationship with these men is they really liked his presence. They wanted him to be around. So much is learned by being around an Elisha. Someone has said that authority is never weakened by kindness. I believe that. So often in the teaching that goes on related to um, ministry today, you're taught to keep a distance from the people. That's you. Because they'll hurt you. I have no doubt that that will happen, but I, I have no doubt I'll hurt you far worse than you'll ever hurt me in, <laughs> in terms of any any damage that's that's going to be done. But I remember Gail Irwin as he talked about that that teaching that is given. It's really a fear, you know, that tries to be manipulated in the life of the servant of the Lord, and that is, you know, build big thick walls around yourself and. Don't let uh, people get too close. And Gail Irwin, I think, had the definitive line related to that. He said, I tried it and it was just too lonely. <laughs> and, you know, that's the truth. That's The body isn't made to operate that way. And it is. It's too lonely. So here you just kind of have to be who you are. And they like who he is and they want him present. And they said, come on and let's go. And... Elisha said, I, I, I can't go. I, you know, my feet are acting up and I got this bum back. No, he said, I'll, I'll go with you. And that's a neat kind of a guy. A little older than all these guys. We said, sure, I'll come right on along. They, you know, they don't want any, uh, they don't want him cutting lumber or anything. They just want his presence. And so, uh, he goes along with them. A great spirit of, uh, of, uh, Elisha there on, uh, uh, on this work day, and you, you know, at the when we got a chance to go over and minister to the uh, other church in the community, and you know, messing around with there and trying to fix some things and do some things. Some of us got on the um, uh, fruitless mulberry tree duty, and uh, we're out there, you know, just cutting these branches down, picking them and putting them up there, and. Uh, and all, I, I spent the whole afternoon trying to keep up with Alden. I felt like he was Elisha here in this place. And 
Alden's one of the brothers here, about 80 years old, huh, Alden? Right in there? Yeah. So here I was trying to keep up with this guy and just so excellent to have his presence there on that day and to work together. Spirit of Elisha, blessing of, of a life like that. And so he went with them and they came to the Jordan and they cut down trees. Here's a group of guys that um, weren't afraid to cut down trees. Weren't afraid to get their hands dirty. Can't all be books. You know, it's got some dirty carpets and dirty toilets and dirty different things that are involved. These guys are ready to work. They're hard workers, willing to be servants. So they went out and they cut down trees. They didn't expect someone else to build something for them. Say, so, all right, let's see. Let's just, okay, looks like we've got to get something. Okay, triple offerings this Sunday. No, they were willing to go out and work hard if it was necessary for that to happen. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe had fell into the water. Ooh. And if you have ever lost or broken a borrowed tool, you know what follows. And he cried out and he said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Now, there's only one worse thing worse than breaking your own equipment or losing your own tools, and that is losing borrowed equipment. Isn't that the truth? I've borrowed equipment. You know, my father-in-law, he has every kind of saw, every kind of everything, uh, and he uses them, and uh, he loves to use them. I don't have an extraordinary love for all of those tools, simply because I don't have the, the time to do those things anymore. But I remember one time I borrowed a tool from him, and it was a, it was a wood splitter, you know, and uh, put that thing in place, and I whacked that. You know, you watch all those Western movies, all those, those cowboy and Native American movies that they used to make, and, and uh, they just take and hit that thing, and that wood just flies. It almost stacks itself in the movies as they hit that <laughs> thing. I borrowed that thing, and I hit it, and, and uh, it was a new fangled kind of wood splitter. I hit that thing, and I missed it by a little bit, and I just snapped the head right off that thing. <laughs> I didn't even get one log, log cut on the silly thing. Of course, I waited about three years to split. It was petrified by that time. <laughs> but so it's a bummer, you know, when you have tools, it's borrowed, and, and, and in those days, an axe head, was very, very valuable. In fact, the whole school didn't even own one. Couldn't afford to own one. That's how valuable it was. Had to borrow one. And now this guy's just hitting with the axe and the thing just heads out into the water. Plunk. He said, can you remember where it hit? I have, yeah, I have, the ripples have stopped. I don't have the slide. Where in the world is that out there? And they've lost that axe head. This guy's really, really bummed. And so what does he do? He goes to the master. And the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place, and so he cut off a stick, threw it in there, and he made the iron float. And therefore, Elisha said, pick it up for yourself. And so he reached out his hand, and he took it. There may be, I don't know, you'll have to see for yourself, there may be a ministry lesson in here somewhere. An axe head was basically a cutting edge. And sometimes in the ministry, in the service of the Lord, especially when things are expanding, you know, you can lose a cutting edge. You can lose it. And any cutting edge that you and I have is a borrowed one from the Lord. The thing that's fascinating to me is they lose this sharpness as it's lost, and they go to the Master. They go to the one who represents God to them. It would be the way that you and I would go to to God himself in prayer. They said, oh, we've lost it, Lord. We've lost it, Master, as they say to Elisha. And the interesting thing that I think is so valuable here is that Elisha says to them, where did it fall? He took them to the last place that they had had that cutting edge. Maybe a nice picture of what Jesus spoke to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. When here was a church that was doing tremendous things for the Lord, but they had left their first love. They had moved away from their first love. And the Lord speaks to that church and He tells them to remember from where they had fallen and to repent and go back and do the first works. He never speaks to that church and says, oh, you have you know, lost your first love. 
He said, no, you've left your first love. And since it was something that they had left, they could go back where they left it and then begin from there again. Sometimes in our service to the Lord, it can go that way. Things get a little dull between us and the Lord and in the ministry. And sometimes there's just that need to go back to where it is that, you know, we last had that. There was that last place that there was joy in service to the Lord. The last place that there was that fruitfulness in, in service uh, to the Lord. Go back to that place. And then, you know, he throws that stick in there, wood, maybe a picture of the cross. The cross is spoken of as a tree in the New Testament. Just going back to that last place where I had that cutting edge and then contemplating upon the simple things, the basic things of, of Christianity and service, and that is that he loves me and I love him and my service is to come out of love for him and be a response to him. You know, you can serve the Lord and you can lose sight of a personal relationship with the Lord. And so Elisha takes them back to that place where it had fallen in and it resurfaces. Beautiful miracle of the Lord. For sure, the very simple lesson of the passage, if you don't like me taking it off uh, that far, that's as, as comfortable as I ever get going with a passage, but as it relates to that, is surely the need of bringing everything to the Lord. The impossible situations, the smallest of things, the loss of something borrowed. You never know what the Lord might do. Now, the king of Syria was making war, verse 8, against Israel. And he took counsel with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. In other words, we're going to set up a camp now to attack the northern kingdom of Israel in such and such a place. And as he would say that to his servants, to his you know, commanding officers, the man of God, Elisha, would send to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass by this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. In other words, he would, he would tell the, the king of Israel what the king of Syria was planning on doing. And then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him, and he was watchful there. And this happened not just once or twice. This happened with some regularity. And therefore, the heart of the king of Israel, all of his plans thwarted, his attempt, you know, to, uh, to fight against God and against his people. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, getting outsmarted. And he called his servants and he said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? We've got a traitor in our midst. Somebody's leaking information here and, and uh, to the enemy. And one of the servants said, uh, None of us is a traitor, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Translation, he tells the king of Israel the things that you say and think are the most private. He knows everything that you're saying. God has revealed it to him. And so the king said, Go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And so it was told him, saying, Surely he's in Dothan. And therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there that they might come by night and surround the city. Now this is dumb. We have to be frank about it, but it is. If verse 12 is true, how are you going to sneak up on this guy? All right, we'll send the chariots in by night, you know, because it'll be, he can't, it led, he has a tough time with kryptonite. And uh, listen, if the Lord's revealing everything, you can't trap a man like that. But they come in and they try to surround, you know, trap them. They surround the city and, and they come by night and surround it. And then the servant of the man of God, he arose early in the morning, went out, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? We're going to die. they got all kinds of... <laughs> this is it. I love you, Elijah. <laughs> And Elisha answered, Do not fear. Give me one good reason. 
But those who are with us are more than those who were with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, what he saw was the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so that was the scene that was there in between. Elisha and the Syrian army was God's army. Nothing ever comes into my life except it comes through that. He is my defense. He stands between me and the the enemies that are coming against him. And so here is a man. He's flipping out as we are so prone to flip out because all he can see is what can be seen with a natural eye. He has no consciousness of the spiritual realm. And Elisha simply asked and said, Lord, open his eyes up to the reality of the situation. Elisha did not say to God, now God, what I want you to do is now provide some protection for me and then open up the eyes of my servant. Lord, open up the eyes of my servant so he can see the protection that you provide for me all of the time and that you provide for your people. Don't produce something. He didn't ask the Lord to produce something in His prayer. He said, Lord, just reveal what is already there and what is always there as it relates to your plans and as it relates to your servants. And so that's the reality and that's why Elisha walked in that peace. He walked in that confidence that the the whole picture isn't what we see in the physical realm. The the real picture, the picture that really matters is what is going on in the spiritual realm. In ancient history, there was a particular uh, general who was a great general and a great leader, and he was bringing a rather undersized uh, army into battle against uh, an, uh, uh, an army that vastly outnumbered them. And when his soldiers came to him, they said to him, we have too few soldiers for this battle. And then that great general said, how many do you count me for? When you counted me, how many did you count me for? Did you count me for just one? I'm worth more than one of the enemy. And that instilled such confidence in that group of men that they rose up to fight valiantly in that battle. I'll tell you, the Lord could maybe speak those words into some of our hearts tonight as we're just maybe in a place of great fear. All we're seeing is what's in the physical realm. That's all we've given any kind of weight to as it relates to a situation in my life. And the Lord might just come and might tap on our heart and say, how many did you count me for in here? How many devils would it take to equal infinite power and infinite ability? How many did you count me for in this battle? Oh boy, once I understand that, all of a sudden peace returns to my heart. That's right, Lord. I was just looking at the physical realm. I wasn't looking at the situation the way that it really, really is and the way that it was going to ultimately you know, be manifested when, when the time came. And so, as Elisha cries out to the Lord, the Lord reveals in verse 18, and so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So, you know, that, that's uh, make that... Uh, I don't care what kind of weaponry you have. Uh, When you're struck with blindness, you're through. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Oh, you you thought you were in Dothan trying to get the prophet? Oh, you're way off base. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led him to Samaria, which was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so it was when they had come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw 
And there they were inside Samaria. Now you can imagine their shock. And then, now when the king of Israel, verse 21, saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? (laughs) Whoa, 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 whoa. Easy, easy, shall I kill them? And so he wants to take it, he wants to kill him, and it's interesting that he says to Elisha, my father, and before the chapter is over, he's going to want to kill Elisha himself. You know, these things, oh, my father, rabbi, rabbi, you know, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. So he answered, Elisha answered him and said, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And so here we see the power of doing good to defeat an army. In that culture, for both Hebrew and Arab alike, when you ate a meal with them, it's, it's almost, and it's to this day, a, a sacred event because you would take, it was the extension of hospitality, and for both of you to eat of the same food meant that the same food had gone into both of your bodies, and now there was a union by virtue of the meal. That's why the Jews would never eat with a Gentile. They never wanted that union based upon a meal. And so now here, Elisha not only doesn't kill them, but he gives them food and water, and now there's a unity between the Syrians who came to attack them and the Israelites by virtue of the meal. It was a means of establishing a covenant. And so he's just established a peace covenant with them now. And how in the world can they fight against them now? And so the food was given and they went back to their master. They prepared, then they prepared, verse 23, a great feast for them. After they ate and drank, he sent them on their way and they went to their master, and so the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Egypt. And so uh, everyone realized, listen, you can't sneak up on this guy. You can't defeat him. His God is uh, too big, and he overwhelmed our attempt to do evil to them with his good. And, and so that during the lifetime of, uh, of that period... They, they ceased to raid on Israel. But it happened after this. In other words, probably a, a great length of time uh, passes between 23 and 24. After this, that Ben-Hadad, this is Ben-Hadad II, king of Syria, he gathered all of his army and he went up and he besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. I don't know when the last time is that you've had a donkey's head for dinner. But it's pretty rough when you do. And it's pretty rough when you'll eat a donkey's head and it's given to you for free by a farmer. It's really rough when you've got to pay 80 shekels of silver to be able to boil the skin and whatever you can boil out of a donkey's head. It is worse than that. And one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. You know how much one-fourth of a cab is? Neither do I, but you don't need to know. (laughs) To know that it's rough. It's not like if they got twice as much for that money, it, it was less of a famine. By the time you're eating donkey heads and eating... Dove droppings. The, the siege on your city has been extended. This is God's way of communicating concerning this situation that it could not have been worse for the people in that city. This is the proverbial impossible situation because the children of Israel inside that city, this Ben-Hadad... Syria rules the entire plain around the city. There's nothing that's going to get through to them. And he has ruled that plain and controlled that plain for such a length of time, for so many months, that the people inside are in this condition. And there is no hope of a rescue coming 
from any quarter on the face of the globe. There is no hope in this situation. It's an impossible situation for the people that are inside of here. And it's exactly the kind of situation that God had warned the children of Israel of way back in the book of Deuteronomy when He gave the law to Moses and said, if you cease to follow Me, if you cease to obey Me, He said in essence, and He goes into detail in those chapters, in essence what He said is you can't believe the life that will come out of that. You can't believe what you will be capable of doing in disobedience to Me. Now, it's very easy when God speaks that to His people and they sit there with a full stomach and the land is open before them and there's food everywhere for them and God has provided for them with manna for 40 years. It's easy for Him to speak that and say, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. And uh-huh. Okay. What's the next book after Deuteronomy? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And you just, and uh, no attention given to it. But when the Lord speaks something, it's the truth. And he intends that he be taken seriously. They would have never ever dreamed that they could end up in this condition. And we haven't even gotten to how bad the condition is yet. That's a couple of verses later. They could have never dreamed that they would end up in this condition when God had given that commandment, and yet He said, listen, you cease to follow Me, and you'll be amazed at what you'll be willing to do and what what your life will be characterized by. And so, the situation that they're in is one of their own choosing now, as they have departed from God and been departed from God for many, many years at this point. And then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my Lord, O King. She's asking for food. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? And here is the the King. Apostate to the marrow in his bones. And here in the midst of this sowing and reaping process that the people are involved in, once that sowing and reaping process ends up in the place that it's in here now, and the horror of it, now all of a sudden it's God's fault. God isn't providing for you. So he turns it around instead of taking responsibility for the choices that he had made as a leader and the people had made even apart from his leadership. He said, where shall I find, can I find help for you? From the threshing floor? Can I bring you some wheat? Is there wheat somewhere that I don't know about here? It's not like we've got a lot of wheat in the place. Or from the wine press? I bring you some wine, something to drink? The king said to her, what is troubling you? And she said, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we'll eat my son tomorrow. And so I agreed and so we boiled my son and we ate him. And I said to her, on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And God had prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy that the people would ultimately come to that place where they would eat the children of their womb. The children of their loins that would come forth. This is the end of the rejection of God the rejection of His way. God says in His Word, the way of the transgressor is hard. God says His His commandments are not burdensome. The life that's burdensome is the life of disobedience to God's Word. And so, the tragic condition of man here, they've gotten to the point where they're boiling their children and eating their children and double-crossing one another in, in all of that God had warned them that that was to come. That was the kind of evil that was in their heart that obedience to God would never allow to come out. I'll tell you, I am thankful for what is in my heart, in the deepest part of my heart, perhaps, in my flesh, one day done away with when I received my new body. But I'm so thankful for what never sees the light of day or never gets an opportunity to express itself even within myself because of just simple obedience to the Lord. This never had 
to happen. And it's tragic what man will do once he's departed from God's Word. And what is most tragic of all is that so often the children end up suffering the greatest for the sins of their parents. It is a tragic time for a society when it reaches the point that the parent will not die for the child, but will sacrifice the child to satisfy their own appetites and their own desires. We gasp at what this verse contains in verses 28 and 29, but I'll tell you, hundreds of thousands of times, all day, every day, on the face of this planet, this happens to children inside the womb. And I tell you, as a man who's 40 years old, a man whose heart has been changed by the Lord, terminally selfish, before I came to know the Lord. So I don't speak this in condemnation to those of you who have been involved in that. There's forgiveness in the Lord. I don't mean to take you back into that in terms of condemnation. But I am ashamed, as ashamed as a person can be, to live on planet Earth in 1995 when children can be slaughtered in that way. And I don't get on this subject very often. I watched Barbara Boxer on C-SPAN the other night defending this abortion procedure, partial birth abortion procedure, trying to defend it there on television and, and, and all. And I listened to her and I marveled at how hard a heart can be. And, and the Congress had voted to you know, ban this partial birth. The partial birth is they, they allow the child... I'm, I'm going to be candid. They, they, the child comes through the birth canal and all that's left in the birth canal is the head. The child is, is delivered alive to that point and then they put a suction thing up into the brain and they suck out the brains and the head collapses and then they... they you see, that way the child can be dead before it comes all the way out of the womb. Excuse me. Do we think that God honors those kinds of technicalities? Do we think He is as stupid and unholy as we are for that to be the right of a parent in this country? I tell you, it ought to be fought with every opportunity we have to vote and call until the possibility of overturning it so the blood isn't on our hands. It's a tragedy. And those of you who are 20 years old and 19 years old and 18 years old, there are one and one half million of your generation that are not on the face of the planet in the United States of America. They're gone. Rob, taken away from your generation and what that generation is intended to be and intended to be by God Himself. What's been done to you out of selfishness? And I'm under control. Don't think I'm out of control. You haven't seen out of control on this issue. A society is drunk. It is drunk to the position of madness. And it is drunk on selfishness when it will take a human life so that it can do what it wants to do. There is no character in that generation or in that nation or in those people. And whatever kind of little turns take place as it relates to Congress or legislation or all of these things, and we're thankful for every victory there is. But believe me, there is no overwhelming character within a nation where that continues. It's terrible. And it's no less awesome and horrific than it is what has happened here, where now the sake of the children 
because they're not in a position of power, is cast away for the convenience of the parent. The Bible says in the last days, one of the characteristics of the last days would be that there would be, men and women would be without natural affection. And the word there in the Greek is a storge. Storge love is the love, it's the love that's there naturally. It's the love between a parent and a child. It's the love between a husband and a wife and a wife and a husband. And God said one of the characteristics of the last days, the social characteristics, is that man will be without that love. I'll tell you, there can be no greater manifestation of the fulfillment of that prophecy than abortion today. Everything else pales in significance. In, in significance. I, I don't say that it's insignificant. It, it just pales. We live in a society that is perverse and it is adulterated. We live in a world that is mad. It is mad. And that's just on one issue. On one issue. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. <laughs> I'll tell you, and I am thankful, but I want to be salt and light in the meantime, and I praise the Lord for those of you in this fellowship that are involved in Modesto Pregnancy Center, in our community, an alternative to other things that are going on in this community. And so it happened when the king, verse 30, heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes and he passed by on the wall and the people looked And there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. And then he said, God do so, you know, do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. I'm going to go and I'm going to chop this head off of this prophet. And he's blaming the prophet for the the condition of the people. Again, it's this madness of blame shifting and, and revenge. All through man's history, Elisha is blamed for, he's made a scapegoat for their failure. It's interesting how easily that happens when times get hard, isn't it? When times got hard in Germany, oh, how easily it was to make a certain group of people a scapegoat. And so, in those types of times, always the blame shifting. It's this. That. No, it was a failure of the nation and the people to obey God. And that was the reason that they were in the condition that they were in. Not because there was someone living godly in their midst. And so Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. He's, he's relaxing. He's obeying the Lord even in the middle of a tough situation. And the king sent a man ahead of him, you know, but before the messenger came to him, he sent a man now to arrest Elisha before he got down there. And then as the guy's coming down, Elisha said to the elders, do you see how the son of a murderer is the son of Ahab? So he's talking about uh, uh, Jehoram. Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? That's called word of knowledge. God just gives him a piece, piece of knowledge that he couldn't otherwise have apart from divine revelation. And he just said, wait a second. No. You've got to take my head off for this situation? And he sent a messenger to do it. And he said, look, when the messenger comes, shut the door. As soon as he comes in, bring him in and shut the door and then hold him right against the door. I'll tell you, you mess with these prophets. You know, they weren't all so wimpy. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with them, there was the, messen- uh, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then he said, Surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And so here is Jehoram. He's saying, This is God's doing. How come He hasn't bailed us out of this thing? I've waited for God. I've listened to you. And now I'm going to abandon God. I'm going to you know, surrender the city. And it's all God's fault. And Elisha said to him, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley 
for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Outside of the gate of Samaria, you're going to be able to get six times the food at one-fifth the price. Tomorrow. It's going to happen. He speaks it. He says, this is the word of the Lord. And he speaks it in the middle of an impossible situation. I mean, you say, like, what? And one guy recognized it. An officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord made windows in heaven that you could just shoot the grain down, could this thing be? And Elisha said, In fact, because of your unbelief, as he expresses his unbelief, you'll see it with your eyes. When God says he's going to do it, it's going to be done. You'll see it, but you shall not eat of it. That's always the way that it is with unbelief. It never stops God from doing what He's going to do. It just stops me from being able to partake in and, and assimilate and, and eat of what it is that, that He's going to do. And so uh, that's what He speaks to this, into this situation of, of unbelief. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate there of Samaria. Now, the lepers usually had to be outside of the city, and they depended on the garbage that got thrown over the walls in order to eat. Now, when they're eating donkey heads for 80 shekels inside the city and they're eating dove dung, nothing is going over that wall. Nothing's going over the wall. And these men are starving to death outside of the wall, uh, the, the gate of the city. And so they, they said to one another, it was just like a light went on, why are we sitting here until we die? <laughs> I think you've got something there. Why are we sitting here until we die? It's not like they're going to throw a pot roast over or something like that. It's not like those Syrians are are clearing out anywhere. I'll tell you, that's a good question for a lot of Christians to ask themselves. Why do I just sit here until I die? Sometimes it takes getting put into a desperate situation in our lives before we finally wake up and say, you know, death awaits me. I've got only so much time to serve the Lord and to be used by Him and to see what He might do through my life. And so here, it's a great question for our heart. If you're just kind of passing time, just kind of sitting outside of the gate, I'll go there and see what Pastor Kyle is going to throw over the wall at Calvary Chapel spiritually the night. I'll go over there. And then finally, it just kind of dawns on you, hey, wait a second, why should I just sit here Wait till I die. (laughs) Time for bed. (laughs) A lot of wasted lives. We should ask that question. Sometimes the Lord puts us in that situation where we have nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. Might as well try it. I don't have anything to lose. I'm a leper waiting for nothing. Might as, might as well take a step out. Who knows what God might do? Never know what He might do. You may be in that place tonight. Hey, it's a great question, as I said. And so they said there again, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we'll enter into the city... The famine's in the city. They're not going to feed us in there. And and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we're going to die. And therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. And if they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we only die. (laughs) I mean, how do you stop a group of guys like that? And so they arose at twilight. I mean, they're so excited about this plan, they they couldn't even wait till the to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to uh, to their surprise, 
no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. And therefore they arose and they fled at twilight and they left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. There they are, they're sitting in their camp, this huge army. Here come these lepers. I'm not an animal. I am not an animal. <laughs> Funny things come into your mind at times. I have a kid sister and she lived with us through her teen years and we watched that movie, and for a while I really had that down. And uh, I would say that she'd get furious. At sensitive teen years, and I'm such a hard, calloused older brother. But here they come, and they're just, they just, you know, whatever they got kind of clanging around and going and everything, and as they're making their way over there, the Syrians go, whoa. Sounds like an army that's been hired. Sounds like the Egyptians have been hired. Sounds like the Hittites have been hired to come against us. And all of a sudden, they're in a panic, and they flee the place. They just see lepers walking into the camp. Just these lepers. The Bible says the day is coming, and it's awesome. Because men and women today, as it relates to God and their rejection of God... They live for the most part under the power of self-delusion. It's self-induced. But the day is going to come when God is going to cause a delusion to come upon the whole earth. We'll be gone by then. So that they should believe the lie. What is the lie? That the Antichrist is the Messiah. And you see how easy it will be for him to do that. Nothing. He just, there's virtually nothing here. He puts the whole camp in fear and, and they run for their lives. And here, these lepers wander into this camp and they come in, verse 8, to the outskirts of the camp and they went into one tent and they ate and they drank. They didn't know what had happened. Well, they just starved to death. They ate and they drank, and they carried from it silver and gold and clothing. And they went and they hid them. So they're looting the camp, best as they can. And then they went back and they went into another tent. Nobody showed up yet. And they carried some from there also, and then they went and hid it. So they're burying their treasure all over the place. Isn't it interesting, as it relates to this passage, how often... All of the difficulties that we anticipated, we were sure were going to be there, vanished by the time we get there. They were convinced. They were convinced, and there was no reason to believe otherwise, that they were going to go in there, they might be fed, or they might be killed. They could not have, in their wildest dreams, dreamt of what it was that God was going to do. And it just reminds me because how often in our lives as Christians we're worried about something. It looks like more than 99 possibilities out of 100 that this is going to happen. We're going to have to deal with this. It's going to be a huge thing. We're going to walk into the middle of the Syrian army. They're going to probably kill us. All of these things. And by the time we get there, God has so thoroughly overruled the situation that there's no difficulty there at all. I, I tell you, I, I really challenge my heart as it relates to the amount of time that is wasted worrying about things that never come to pass. Never needed one moment to be concerned about it because the difficulty was going to be moved away at the last possible moment as a part of God's work. 
And so they're hiding all of these things. And then they said to one another, we're not doing what is right. This day is a day of good news. That's what the gospel means, is good news. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. And so here is conviction in their heart. They have stumbled upon. They've become recipients of good news. And here they're convicted that there's no way in light of the greatness of the need that is all around us and the people that are starving to death within that city, it just would not be right for us to keep this good news to ourselves. And so they go back to the camp to make the good news known. And I'll tell you, isn't that the truth as it relates to the gospel in our own lives? The good news and that conviction that the Lord puts within our heart. Hey, don't keep that a secret. Not in the middle of 1995 on planet Earth. Listen, don't keep that to yourself as a treasure. Make it known. And so they go to tell the king's household. And they went and they called the gatekeepers, verse 10 of the city, and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp and surprisingly no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeeper called out, and they told it to the king's household inside. And the king arose in the night, and he said to his servants, Let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry, and therefore they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, then we'll catch them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants answered, Again, desperation breeds some pretty good plans. And he said, uh, please, let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all of the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed, I say, they may become like all of the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. And therefore they took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan, and indeed all the road was full of garments and weapons, which they threw off to make themselves lighter in their fleeing, which the Syrians had thrown away in their great haste. And so the messengers returned and told the king. And then the people went out and they plundered the tents of the Syrians. Can you imagine their hunger as they head in there? And, and God doesn't even make... The, the tables are set. The food's out. It's all, it's all right there. This, I mean, he's a, he's a detail guy. He's an attention to detail guy. And they go in. All of it's there. And they begin to plunder. And so a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two seahs of, ba- of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. Listen, when the Lord says something, that's the truth. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Every promise is like that in this word as it relates to us and as it relates to anything that he speaks. Now, the king had appointed the officer in whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. This guy that didn't believe, he was in charge of handling the gate. But the people trampled him in the gate. You can imagine. There's food out there and nobody's out and the whole city is heads right through and he was in charge of the gate. You know, tried to have him line up single file or something. And he said, forget He trampled him. He died just as the man of God had said who spoke when the king came down to him. And so it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two seahs of barley for a shekel and a sea of fine flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And then that officer had answered the man of God and said, Now look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he had said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. He heard the good news, but he died before he could enjoy it. How many people, how many men and women today die in their sins 
They never ever thought that an unexpected death would keep them from another opportunity to respond to the good news. And yet it snuck up on them. Don't let it sneak up on you. The good news of Jesus Christ. Salvation found in Him. Forgiveness of sins. A new start found in Him. And tonight, if you'll confess your sins to God, if you're not a Christian here tonight, ask for forgiveness of your sins and say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, the full and satisfying payment for my sins, and that He was buried and He rose again on the third day. And God, I give You my life tonight. I don't want to take a chance on what could happen in the gate of Samaria or what could happen in any street in Modesto or what could happen to me physically in my own house. I don't want to risk anything as it relates to believing the good news and making it my own. I give you my life tonight. I'll tell you, there's no guarantee that anyone will have another chance. This man didn't get another chance to receive that good news. Tonight is a great night to do that.